you know, it's interesting if you trace back, and I, I didn't really appreciate this until I was uh, inside Twitter, where, you know, the acquisition of a company happened uh, uh, a few months before the IPO. Turns out that if you go back to the origins of Twitter and, and so how it was created, there was an ambiguity from the very beginning of what is Twitter for? Mm. And um, the founders didn't agree. And I found that as I spent time in the company, the leadership and just up and down the ranks the, of the company, it was clear what the product did in terms of, you know, how tweets work and where they go and so forth. Um, but what's the purpose of Twitter? What is it for? Why is Twitter the way it is? Why does social media contribute to our growing polarization and division? Why is artificial intelligence perceived as so destructive? And also, how do we actually leverage that technology for good in reducing the divisions in our politics? These are some of the most important questions I think of our time. And the guest I have coming up for you today is actually the person that you just heard from in that short clip at the beginning, Deb Roy, who was in 2013 to 2017, the chief media scientist at Twitter. Currently, he is the professor of media and art sciences at MIT, also the director of the MIT Center for Constructive Communication. And if that wasn't enough, he also is the CEO of Cortico, which is a nonprofit organization that he leads that is focused on leveraging artificial intelligence to actually reduce polarization. I think he is the perfect guest to talk about and answer some of the questions that we have in the hopeful majority, but why actually social media is built the way it is and how do we actually leverage our algorithms for good? Every Monday, YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your content, the hopeful majority comes at you with different conversations, different interviews, different dialogues, because I think that we live at a moment where the majority of us are actually interested in open-minded conversation while there is a vocal extreme across the political spectrum that riles us up. And if that resonates with you, then you're actually, believe it or not, a member of the hopeful majority. So with that, let's welcome Deb Roy onto the show. Deb Roy, welcome to the hopeful majority. Thank you. Great to be here. So we, we suddenly had to do a take two of the recording. And now, as you said, instead of live trees behind you, we have dead trees in the form of books. Indeed. Here we are. <laughs> so I, I, I really appreciated getting to, to meet you about um, two weeks ago through, through our mutual friend, Peter Levine. And I, I remember going to that conversation and one of the, the sort of the core questions that struck out to me when you had sent the, the brief uh, about your work was, can we use AI and digital technology to advance trust in, in society? What do you think? What's the answer? I think the answer is yes, we can. Um, AI is a, it's a powerful technology and, you know, in particular, large language models is a language technology. And um, we've had a series of extraordinary language technologies that everything from the printing press to um, other electronic, electric and electronic technologies and um, LLMs are an astonishing advance for sure. But uh, in terms of just in history, hmm. uh, language technologies can, uh, in various ways, amplify and transform um, uh, people for the better or for the worse. Um, so I, I definitely think we can channel and harness the power to um, strengthen uh, positive connections and build community and uh, build trust. Um, and um, that's what we're trying to trying to do. So what I what I appreciate about that perspective is is that the the dominant narrative around AI, especially with the, the, the cataclysmically fast pace of adoption and advancement in that technology is that all you hear is sort of its destructive potential. Um, you hear how it's a challenge that we're going to have to deal with as opposed to an opportunity that that we we can actually unlock. And the perspective that you bring to it is that, you know, these LLMs, the way that our networks work, that we can actually harness them in an effective way to catalyze trust. Um, is there something that you see in this technology that maybe others aren't seeing? I, I don't know if, uh, you know, it's not just in the technology, but the approach and being clear on what the aims are. So, you know, there's, uh, there's definitely um, just an explosion now, a creative explosion of um, what can you do with this extraordinary new um, technology, these new capabilities. And um, 
then if you look at where a lot of the activity is today, it's, you know, in startups and kind of in the commercial sphere, um, you know, ultimately, um, you've got to figure out a way to make money. And so that's going to drive certain kinds of explorations. But I think, you know, we are thinking about how do you build trust and, and community and connection, um, just looking at through a commercial lens is just too limiting, right? And so the aims we set, so for example, we're interested in building civic muscle, right? Building, uh, uh, creating new opportunities for people to develop um, skills and, and practice them, right? Um, how, you know, so you can start with the question, could AI possibly be relevant for building civic muscle? And then how would you um, design opportunities, design tools, design systems that bring AI into contact with people with that goal clearly in mind, as opposed to, um, can I automate this? Can I make it more efficient? Can I save money? Whatever, right? Um, and so if you come in with a clear North Star or um, purpose for it, um, then I think the, the power and the kind of possibility um, is pretty clear. Um, so I don't know if it's so much I'm seeing it in the technology or kind of when you, you know, are clear up front, what's your intention and bring it in. Um, and then where are the places where it makes sense for AI to take over, to do work? And where would you never want it to take over? Because it then kind of misses the point of what you're is there a, Is there a way to align the two North Stars or incentives of making money and building civic muscle and connection. And the reason why I ask that is because this is especially the case with social media technologies. And we'll go there and, and with your you know time at Twitter as well. I'm very curious on your perspective, but it's something we hear often, which is if you want to make money, if you want to drive engagement, um, it's often in times conflict with nuance and you know civic engagement, et cetera. Do you see a way in which those two incentives can be relatively aligned as it as it comes to AI? Um, yes, I don't. I don't think they are in any way mutually exclusive. So you know, just just to make this really straightforward, say Please. the civic muscle you wanted to build was learning how to facilitate a, a better uh, conversation to become a dialogue facilitator, and then say there is a for-profit company that knows how to train facilitators, and mm -hmm. you wanted to have better dialogue, better facilitation in your workplace because you think it will <clears throat> make for a more um, uh, peaceful and harmonious workforce that will let you make more money. Well, then you would go and pay that company to help you and people in your workplace learn how to facilitate dialogue. And that's a for-profit model and the company providing the service is making money and you're paying it. Um, and it's actually being paid to build civic muscle. So I don't think, you know, just setting AI and technology aside, there's nothing about um, a, uh, a for-profit model that is necessarily just immediately, you know, at odds with building civic mm -hmm. muscle. But as you seek to um, scale uh, a platform and have algorithms that are primarily focused on engagement in order to drive advertising, you know, the kind of now classic model of social media, um, well, where's civic muscle and um, and and those aims? They're they're not they're not they're not there, right? There's something mm -hmm. else driving uh, the um, uh, driving the path forward. And uh, there's no reason to expect by accident civic muscle enhancing, uh, you know, properties are just going to fall out, uh, you know, by accident or, or as some kind of a natural byproduct. Uh, no reason to expect that. So we're, we're, we're recording this uh, three days after the presidential debate, and you brought up how these algorithms, especially in social media, and then we'll jump back to AI, but I wanna focus on social media for a quick second. You mentioned how the algorithms are focused on engagement, right? And I remember when we first built Bridge, Bridge USA, our focus was that we want to quote unquote, win on social media, whatever that means by the way, right? But that was our aspiration. And um, what we were finding was that the content and the mission we were pushing, it was very difficult to do it in a way that drove engagement without driving outrage. It was like hard to hard to balance those two competing ends. So three days ago during the debate, our intrepid social media team put out a clip, uh, a reel on Instagram, a video on TikTok. On TikTok, it now has 9 million views, I think, or something like that. It's got 1.3 million likes. 
It's got 300,000 shares. And I think it added about 12,000 new followers, which is like a level of reality we hadn't had before. And I was reflecting a little bit as to why that was. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious whether you think it's simply just a question of designing content in a more effective way, or if you think that engagement inherently, the way that we as humans operate is one in which we just love the crazy stuff. And it's just more interesting and exciting. So that's just what the algorithm pushes. It's not the algorithm's fault. It's, it's the way that we as, as consumers behave. I mean, you're raising, you're asking a question uh, that has a complicated answer if there was one. Well, at we all. got 40 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, you know, I would say that it, it depends, like starting with, uh, first of all, congratulations that you had, you know, it sounds like your first truly viral uh, piece of media. You know, in the like, defense of our social media team, it was our third very truly viral yeah, one. But yeah, in this one yeah. was the highest level. Yeah, it was the highest level. Yeah. And, um, you know, what, what was in it, uh, what was the viewing context of uh, what was kind of the window in which it spread? Um, if that same clip were put out today, would it be different um, in terms Probably. of how it spread? Probably. So, um, you know, I think the, um, that's the sort of cognitive context that uh, the people that you could potentially reach are in, right, will interact with the actual message you put out to, to decide whether they want to share it or how they react. Um, it's weird. I'm, I'm kind of reminded of uh, years ago, I, I um, uh, was involved in work. I actually co-founded a company called Bluefin Labs, and we were analyzing how people yeah. in social media would respond to what they watch on television. <clears throat> and um, we analyzed uh, one of the most expensive kinds of ad campaigns a brand can make. Uh, it's just Coca-Cola advertising for the Olympics. And um, they had made an ad where a um, Olympic swimmer swims across the pool um, and then props himself up on one elbow and cracks open a uh, refreshing Coke. Oh, and I remember it. that one. Yeah. And it just spiked in our analytics. We were, you know, we were looking at uh, public social media posts that we could causally attribute to everything that was on television in the US, including ads. And we just found this huge negative spike in reaction to that ad. And, um, you know, our uh, interpretation, if you go and read what they were saying, it was basically you're in this health and kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of uh, athletic and kind of athleticism and, and uh, this, this extraordinary athlete pouring sugar water into their body, right? And it was the content, it was played during the Olympics, right? In the middle of the Olympic Games, they had spent a lot on it and it was, totally the wrong cognitive context in which to show that that same ad played outside of the Olympics and it just got a muted response. No one really mm. uh, had any uh, reaction to it at all. So just, uh, it's different, obviously in, in every, in, in many senses from what you're describing, but if you, in a moment where you see, um, uh, and, and you have a, a certain mindset and you can get the messaging in that moment, um, you know, it can spread. So, I, but I think it's great that, you, you accomplish that. Um, and, um, uh, so well, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say, I'll say one thing though, which is that there is actually a lot of similarity between the Coke ad that you just talked about and what we did, which was essentially what we had done was, um, right when the debate was at its, I think, peak viewing level, we essentially yeah. dropped a reel that actually was like a compilation mashup of all the presidential debates from the sixties to, I think the the early 2000s where all these presidential candidates are just complimenting each other. And the idea was that you create direct contrast. Yeah. Um, yeah. My feeling though, is that we've done stuff like that before. And what our team is trying to figure out is, is there a playbook when it comes to algorithms or is it much more like a slot machine? And specifically the reason why I asked this question is because that raises the question of <clears throat> whether or not companies are able to directly alter algorithms as times change, as moments change, or if they sort of set these things into motion, and then it's just about figuring out and, and, and hacking the algorithm to essentially grow your brand or build your influence. Yeah. Um, well, let me start by saying I don't know. Uh, but that, <laughs> won't, that won't stop me from guessing. Uh, so as you get Please, guess away. Talking. That's that's the yeah. point of the podcast. You know, you have yeah. like infinite immunity. Yeah. I, I think it's neither. Uh, I think it's neither that there is some kind of a formula or an algorithm that once you understand it, you can keep triggering it. It's also not the slot machine where it's kind of uh, random. Um, I, I think the challenge is, um, 
that the you know if you are looking at social media and what you're trying to reach as an audience right mm -hmm. um, and I, I i say that well of course you are but you know originally social media was not supposed to be about reaching an audience it was supposed to be a social network which is you know maybe a um prelude to what um you know we'll we'll talk about soon which is yep. you know thinking about alternative forms of ai enhanced digital networks they don't have to be social media networks um, but if your goal is to reach an audience um, the challenge which is exasperated by the sort of deep penetration of the internet and of, of social media itself that means that your audience um, is is connected right they're connected at light speed at the at the speed of the internet which means their uh, mindset is constant is fluid it's shifting and so it's not a slot machine that there it's random right but the viewing context into which or the sort of the, the mindset into which you are going to put your next piece of hopefully viral content is different than the last. And so if it worked once, um, it's not going to work again, probably, because the, the context has shifted. And paradoxically, for some of the most effective, uh, you know, viral ad campaigns done by brands that were like brilliant, when they tried to do it again, um, it completely flops because the first campaign actually itself had an impact on how people viewed the brand and it was no longer, um, mm. what was, uh, what was the, um, old spice smell like yep. a man's man. I yep. don't know if you remember. Yep. Your, I, I remember it with Terry yeah. Crews, right. And yeah. And so those commercials. Yeah. So, yeah. So there was a, a series of ads that went absolutely viral and it drove up the, the sort of brand reputation, sales, everything. I mean, it just kind of rocked that brand's world and had real bottom line impact. And then they tried to do it again. And, yeah. um, um, and at that point, the, the concept of what is that brand had already shifted. They had effectively shifted it and made it a much more relevant to uh, basically a younger audience. And so when they tried to do it again, it just felt old and lame right. and tired. Right. And it completely flopped when they were, when, you know, everyone behind it was expecting another step function up um, because mm -hmm. things had changed. Right. Um, so that's actually like literally within the ecosystem of one one brand or one, you know, one voice trying to uh, do the same thing again. But of course, uh, in general, no one has that much influence. Right. And you're you're uh, putting your messaging into a uh, into a um, not a network, not a audience, but an audience network. Right. So uh, I promise we're going to get to the to the work you're doing with Cortico yep. and the AI enhanced digital network that you've got going. But I think it's important actually to just hash out a couple more of these social media questions because I think they lay the foundation for that conversation. Because yep. you made this fascinating distinction between AI network and a social media network, mm -hmm. and and specifically the I think the implications those two have. So before we get there, um, one of the things that the audience learned in the introduction was you were chief media scientist at Twitter from 2013 to 2017. And when you right now discuss, you know, the way in which consumer behavior and context matters, right, in the context of a video, in the context of an ad campaign, that raises the question of what matters more? And in some ways, this is a reductive question, but what matters more? Is it the algorithms and the platform and what they privilege? Or is it the consumer behavior and what the people are consuming, what they're focused on? Um, how do you weigh that equation? And is that a false dichotomy? And is there something that people are missing in that equation as they think about social media and polarization? I mean, if you pose it as a dichotomy, I would say it's false. If you pose it as kind of two um, of the most important factors or the two most important factors that combine and, and you can weight them differently, then yeah, I think that's a, a good way to summarize the two factors. The reason it's a false dichotomy is um, what the algorithms are doing is of course, tuning into what, how people are behaving and continuously adapting, mm -hmm. right? So I mean, in simplest terms, if you um, uh, just, you know, simplified dramatically what's actually going on, um, Everyone's posting messages and you just look at which ones are getting the most clicks and you just uh, prioritize elevate those, elevate those. Right. And if you just do that and that's your, so your algorithm is um, count clicks and 
uh, elevate ones with more clicks. Say that's your, your baseline algorithm, nothing more. Um, uh, which is it? You know, just I'll turn the question back to you. Is it the people's behavior or is it the algorithm? Because you could swap out a different algorithm um, mm -hmm. and say if it gets clicked the most, I don't know, drop it down because I want to favor yeah. the long tail. You'd get completely different behavior. But it's it's a uh, it's a very complex system where people's behavior is interacting with the algorithm. So you change the algorithm, of course, that'll change people's experience. But if people change their behavior, the algorithm's just yes, uh, completely dependent. So they're interdependent. Right. I actually get a lot of flack for this because I I am very firmly on the notion that it is consumer behavior. It's people's behavior. And actually, I think the analog to social media is junk food. Um, in the in the in the forties and fifties, uh, Lay's and these other companies had very little sales. In the sixties, seventies, eighties, through marketing campaigns and through the fact that people just loved that product, they just dove into it, and you just saw an uptick in sales, an uptick in sales. And all they did was they just sold junk food to people that like junk food, right? Yeah. And suddenly tomorrow, if suddenly everybody liked broccoli, the broccoli company would be doing really well, right? Yeah. And part of the reason why we actually call the show The Hopeful Majority is because there's a phrase that we oftentimes use called the outrage industrial complex. And the idea is, is essentially that outrage sells. Um, yeah. But the yeah. only reason outrage sells and you make money off of outrage is because you, the person listening, wants the outrage. And, yeah. and in some ways, it, it, it actually makes me sometimes pessimistic, Deb, because it means that in some ways we might actually be fighting human nature because in some ways we as humans love entertainment. We love outrage. So the question is not whether or not you're trying to eliminate it. You're trying to strike this balance. Um, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I'm not exactly sure how people actually think about that. Well, let's go back to our simple example for a second um, uh, of, of why... It is actually both factors and not just people. Um, the um, if we did flip the uh, the details of our uh, of our ridiculously simple algorithm, so rather than the posts that got the most clicks, you highlighted the ones that got the least. Um, it would completely change um, what people would be consuming, but it would also change how many people would go back to that service, mm -hmm. right? And so it's not that the algorithm doesn't matter. It's just that there's an interaction effect. So, I mean, now go to your food analogy and say, well, why do we still have broccoli at all? Hmm. Um, there's some market for it. There's some demand for it. And why is Bridge USA spreading? Um, for the same reason that Mr. Rogers' neighborhood uh, turned out to have <laughs> If you watch the documentary on the emergence of that, uh, of, of that uh, show, People thought it was crazy that it was a race to the bottom of television for, you know, getting children's attention was just having outrage, just having, you know, uh, junk food for the mind. That was the early days of television. And um, uh, this idea that something that slows things down, that is calm, that has a very different kind of ethos behind it, it felt like the broccoli of television and that... Mm. Everyone knows that every kid, when they can have their hand on the dial, will just go to the junk food. Turns out people were wrong, and there was actually a demand for it. Now, there are different ways you could package up broccoli for television, and um, there was actually creative brilliance in how they did it. And I, so I, I think that um, uh, we're, we're kind of selling ourselves short, um, you know, we the people, if we think that um, once given... Um, endless junk food, we won't realize something's wrong, that we're not feeling right. And um, it, it, you know, it's different to know something's not feeling right from saying, oh, I'm going to self-regulate, I'm going to take this other thing, uh, especially if that other thing's not even available, et cetera. So it's, but um, I do think there is a growing sense of ill ease that something is wrong and that we can connect it to um, yes. the, the, the kind of mediated environment that we're all stuck in. Um, so I, I actually think that's like the perfect bridge to what you're building, but I don't want to leave out the fact that you compared Bridge USA to Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. And I think if you were the chief media scientist at Twitter, I think our new title needs to be the chief broccoli officer of, <laughs> of civility and, and dialogue. Um, and actually, in, in some ways, it is funny to me, but honestly, the way we think about it as a, as a challenge, as building the show, is that we are, we're not selling junk food, we are selling broccoli. And mm -hmm. so... 
if everybody just loved broccoli, all of a sudden everyone would be healthy. We wouldn't have an obesity crisis, but that's not the way the world works. And so we have to think about consumer behavior, not in terms of what I want, but in terms of what the consumers are at. And so it's like this interesting balancing act where you got to, you know, season the broccoli, you got to boil it a little bit and, and you got to still serve it in an interesting way. Um, really quickly, as we go to some of the AI work that you're, you're now focused on with Cortico and, and also with your other hat at the MIT Center for Constructive Communication, um, I just want to ask, what does it mean to be the chief media scientist at Twitter? Like, what what does that what does that role entail? Because I think that'll help folks sort of understand how you're approaching the problem set right now. Yeah, I mean, it was a it was an invented title and role. <laughs> it's a good role. A, yeah, I had a pretty unique um, uh, kind of role within Twitter, but I you know I had co-founded and I was CEO of. A, a company that was analyzing the uh, at scale how people on on Twitter and public Facebook uh, uh, posts how, how people were responding to what they're watching on television. And that was the and, and that company was acquired by Twitter. And, and, and what uh, was the company called? I'm just curious. Bluefin Labs. It was called. Okay. Oh, got it. Got it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And um, after the acquisition, um, the you know the original idea was for the. Um, the, the capabilities we'd produced, we, we had developed at Bluefin to be used for uh, creating new products uh, and, and capabilities within the Twitter platform. Um, but um, my own interests were not to just kind of see that product get integrated into Twitter, but, um, uh, you know, in conversation with Twitter leadership, Ali Rogani, um, Jack Dorsey and others, that there was a, a more general possibility to um, build on some of the analytics that our company had developed, um, but also kind of zoom out um, to just understand patterns of use and dynamics of the platform, which, you know, it's interesting if you trace back, and I, I didn't really appreciate this until I was uh, inside Twitter, where, uh, you know, the acquisition of a company happened uh, uh, a few months before the IPO. So I actually helped uh, in pretty visible ways with positioning the company for its uh, its IPO and um, its kind of relation to brands, because like um, all of the platforms, you know, Facebook and Twitter were the first two to really build a kind of ad supported model. So, you know, how brands think about the platform mattered from a business perspective. So that was sort of some of the uh, things that I was uh, engaged in. Um, early on, but the kind of usage patterns, it, um, it it turns out that if you go back to the origins of Twitter and, and so how it was created, there was an ambiguity from the very beginning of what is Twitter for? Hmm. And um, the founders didn't agree. And I found that as I spent time in the company, the leadership and just up and down the ranks the, of the company, it was clear what the product did in terms of, you know, how tweets work and where they go and so forth. Um, but what's the purpose of Twitter? What is it for? Um, you know, and, and even at the highest level, is it um, a tool for you to let the world know what's happening? Or is it a tool for you to know what's happening in the world? Even those that kind of at that highest level. And if you say it's both, um, for every day, you know, for hundreds of millions of people to let the world know what's happening, you can't expect hundreds of millions of people to build an audience, right? So that feels more like a social network. Uh, but if I want to know what's happening in the world, that's starting to feel more like a media experience. And so there was this, um, there was lots to do, lots to keep a chief media scientist busy in terms of thinking about patterns of use. Um, but there was this fundamental challenge, which is, um, uh, it was never clear. And I still don't think Man, it's so clear what that, it's for. It, it, it's so fascinating for you to describe in some ways, the distinction between a product and the purpose of the product. Yeah. Because I think actually a lot of the social media folks, whether it's Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Dorsey, whether it's um, Elon Musk in some ways right now, though honestly, he seems pretty clear on what the purpose is. In some ways, he seems more clear than Jack Dorsey or the others do. That's at least my view. But you know, you look at um, uh, you know Pavel Durov, the founder of Telegram, um, a lot of these folks were tech folks that mm -hmm. were not necessarily trained in understanding the role of their product in society, but just in terms of what their product is. And I think a lot about that as it relates to AI and what Sam is building at OpenAI and what others are doing at other places. Um, how do you think we 
avoid some of those traps as this new technology takes off in the same way. And in fact, in, in much more of a societally significant way. I think being intentional about why you're doing it and what is the, the aim in human terms and human impact, what are the human needs um, to start there? And so just to take one other social network that we don't typically call social media, but has, I think, like a billion users now, LinkedIn, and you trace back its history and um, you find that the origin story was super clear. There was a concept, you know, Reid Hoffman um, understood that in a networked world, um, individuals would want to build and maintain their personal brand um, in a network. And there was a, a concept, um, a, a prediction of where things were going and a certain kind of need that would create value. And that kind of intentionality, right? When there was a clear business uh, and sort of commercial, uh, commercially aligned uh, vision there, but um, it was leading, it, it was leading the design decisions all along um, for how they developed, uh, their, their platform. So yeah, when I think about AI and, you know, this goes back to, so, you know, take this idea of civic muscle. Um, okay. Which, um, is that, is that kind of a clear enough? I mean, you can, before, instantly... before you, before you fully, yeah, before you fully go in that direction, there's just one last piece I want to touch on. Um, because again, I think it lays the foundation, you, you know, you mentioned Reed and sort of what he did with LinkedIn and it's obvious that LinkedIn in some ways has avoided a lot of the traps that, uh, Twitter and you know yeah. Meta and other companies have fallen into uh, because they have that clear identity. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think about Twitter with Elon Musk versus where you had Twitter between um, or where you were at Twitter between 2013 yeah. and 2017? Yeah, actually, let me let me um, say one more thing about LinkedIn because it kept, comes back it. to your 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 dichotomy um, <clears throat> of. Uh, human behavior versus kind of algorithms or sort of uh, let's let's generalize from algorithms to kind of design of the technology, right? Um, and m my point that both matter and they interact. So just to take two distinct examples, early days of LinkedIn, people started to game how they used it to drive up the count of how many people uh, had connected with them you know, because you, mm. you would display the number of connections. And so that became kind of like getting as many likes as you can or getting as many friends as you can to just max out that number. And so um, the LinkedIn team just capped it and said, once you hit 500, it just says 500 plus. And that behavior, which was just being driven by uh, a very specific um, uh, design feature, um, eased off, huh. okay? So that's just uh, literally the technology affecting behavior. Can okay, now flip to the other side. Um, why is it LinkedIn doesn't have the same problems with this newsfeed? It has a newsfeed. It looks a lot to me like the newsfeed on Twitter, sure. or, right? Um, so why don't they have trolling and you know all, all of the all of the issues uh, at the scale that these others? I mean, these large platforms, like, you know, uh, Meta employ tens of thousands of people to police behavior. So, um, and there's nothing like that, as far as I know, at LinkedIn. Um, well, if you go back and look at how they introduced the newsfeed, um, they did it slowly. And for something like the first year and a half, when it was feature complete and shipped, um, the vast majority of users on LinkedIn had a read-only experience. And meanwhile, uh, what the team did was they worked with a few hundred um, model citizens of LinkedIn, uh, well-known, uh, professionally successful influencers. And, um, and those influencers had everything to lose, right? In behaving badly, there's good, no reason to behave badly, but they, they gained an audience, so they had incentives, and they modeled the behavior that the LinkedIn team wanted to see on their newsfeed, and then they let the rest of us in. And that norm setting, wasn't done by the tech. If you look at the actual features of the newsfeed, it's just, you know, it's just like a pretty, you know, just cherry pick from other, uh, other platforms, right? Uh, first order, but the norm setting came from human behavior.
So it can be either the feature, how you design it and you write it in code and, and that affects norms, or you can decide who you invite in and on what grounds and, and then that sets the expectations for the, the rest of us. So is there is there a way to take the and where I'm going with this is I would love to see your thoughts and how you apply sort of the successful norm setting that LinkedIn was able to achieve versus, you know, others. Um and I'm sure they lost a little bit. I mean, their bottom line and their market cap is not anywhere close to, you know, where Meta is, for example. Um, yeah. And so I'm sure there was some bottom line trade-offs to that model, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm curious how you apply that LinkedIn success story to AI. And as we go there, do you think there's a way for someone like Elon to mm -hmm. do that as it relates to X right now? Or do you think the ball is too far down the line and there's no way to sort of reverse norm set. You got to do it at the beginning. How do you how do you think about that problem set? Yeah, I think it's very hard to uh, significantly redirect a platform once you have, you know, uh, a very large user base that have a certain expectation for what they're going to find there and um, a business model that becomes reliant on that use. So the unique experiment that's playing out with Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter is um, the reliance on the revenue um, has been basically dismissed, right? I mean, he has, as far as I can see from the outside, I have no inside you know, view anymore into Twitter, um, but has um, made changes, I don't think intentionally to take a wrecking ball to the the revenue model, the sort of the business model, but that's uh, what actually has resulted, right? The, the business has been decimated, um, but it's not, it seems to not be his primary concern. So the experiment of if you could decouple dependence on a revenue stream and try to steer a, a, a kind of platform with hundreds of millions of users in a completely different direction or a significantly different direction, that's the experiment that uh, he is right now playing out. You know, uh, one thing that I think is quite apparent is um, his personal views about content moderation and so forth are absolutely reshaping uh, how they are treating that, you know, that uh, super complex and difficult problem, right? By removing a lot of uh, limitations. Um, obviously, it's also leading to uh, conflict uh, with different legal regimes in different countries, whether it's mm -hmm. Brazil or Germany, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, no, I think just um, as a, you know, uh, a former chief media scientist and still a uh, interested observer of how uh, patterns, um, you know, emerge and uh, different interventions and what, what, what could happen, I think it's fascinating uh, to have this experiment being run for us uh, by so Elon, Elon Musk. I think the last 15 minutes are fascinating because I think it was really interesting to get sort of your um, expert and honest view in terms of how some of these social media platforms differ and the success story. So with all of that knowledge, can you tell us a little bit about what you're building with Cortico and and sort of the next step in the, the technological timeline of humanity, which is AI going from social media? Sure, yeah. Well, this the story of Cortico and, and the research um, at the MIT Center for Constructive Communication, uh, you know, which which um, uh, led to and continues to be a, a kind of a, a research to deployment kind of partnership between these two organizations. Um, I'll trace back to um, <clears throat> 2016. We um, at MIT, our team was analyzing uh, patterns of conversation and sort of content on Twitter at at a large scale um, as a way to understand. Um, where um, people were were at with relation to the main issues of the 2016 presidential election. And we actually analyzed Twitter patterns at scale. We partnered with the Commission for Presidential Debates. Uh, there were mm -hmm. three of them between Clinton and Trump and uh, one vice presidential debate. And we used um, our analytics. The, the, the good old days where there were still three debates. That's right. On a normal yeah. timeline. <laughs> well, the Commission for Presidential Debates actually was right. you know, doing things, right? As right. opposed to this. And um, uh, so that was the context um, where we were analyzing 
um, patterns on on Twitter, and uh, you know, actually um, had a uh, some influence in the selection of questions that the moderators used for the uh, the debates. By the time the debates were over, um, and before the election was even held in 2016. Um, it started becoming clear to us a couple of things that this idea of what we're trying to do was use um, our access to Twitter data as a listening channel to understand um, what were on the minds of uh, everyday Americans. Um, and um, not about the horse race, about who's going to win, but about the, the issues. And um, that the conclusion we came to is that uh, using Twitter as a listening channel um, was ineffective. In fact, the channel, in a sense, had become corrupted because um, so much of what was actually being viewed in 2016 were, you know, the loudest voices, uh, the people who could craft the most provocative, often, you know, um, uh, provocative in terms of negative emotional responses kind of messages. And a lot of them, you know, caricatured other people, et cetera, to, to get there. And that was driving so much of the so-called conversation on Twitter. And many people who might have more nuanced views or more complex things to say, uh, um, not only would they not get as many retweets and views, um, but became gun shy because, you know, they would get attacked and, and so forth. So, you know, when people asked uh, us to explain what happened with the election. It was a surprise ending, as I'm sure we all <laughs> remember. Um, I really felt like, although we had, you know, analyzed massive quantities of, of what people were saying on, on one of the big platforms, uh, I felt we had very little insight into what was actually mm -hmm. going on. So that's kind of the, the pushing off point for what has become Quartico today, which was, okay, so there's clearly power in uh, digital networks, the internet, uh, the, the AI that can shape, uh, you know, what what happens on on these networks. Um, but if our goal is to actually listen to and listen authentically, and that we started developing this idea of the underheard voices, underheard perspectives, those are two related concepts. People who just won't feel comfortable uh, tweeting what they think, right, for a variety of reasons. Um, from being, they, they might be attacked, or they, they're not confident in a strong point of view, to what they have to say won't fit in a tweet. There's all sorts of reasons why you would uh, sort of self-select out and, and not voice your, you know, share your voice at all. Mm -hmm. um, and underrepresented, uh, underheard. It's like, that, it's like that silent majority concept. I mean, it's basically it is, the, yeah, the idea yeah. of the podcast. And, yeah. And, yeah. But it might also be that someone decides to show up, but what they say and how they engage is kind of safe and light. Right, uh, right, and, and anything of substance, right, and actually, right. it's relatively, it's it's relatively milk toast because they're exactly. they're afraid yeah. of what the consequences are. Yeah, and so it could both be underheard voices that just don't show up, or un underheard um, perspectives, which is they show up, but they're actually not sharing things that you know that they they could. And um, so the idea was to take a step back, knowing that technology has the power to create powerful. Uh, new forms of communication and connection, um, could we go back to sort of basic principles, right? How do you, when you have uh, a community or a society that has become fragmented, that has um, become taken over by toxic polarization and mischaracterizations of one another, what are methods to actually um, build trust and build um, constructive uh, connections? And um, well, there's a lot of actually ancient practices. We started calling them ancient wisdoms. And there's actually, in some cases, ancient social technologies involved, like talking pieces. You know, if you people are uh, talking over each other or not giving each other space, um, hand them a, a beautiful object. Yeah. yeah. And say, whoever holds this gets the talk. Do we all agree? If you don't agree, then you, you're not wanting to have the kind of conversation we're trying to have. Okay, you agree. Well, um, this thing literally moderates you know, and kind of slows down and allows people to say their piece. That's a technology, right? And 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 there's also human agreement around it. So we started investigating and kind of learning from people who teach dialogue and and have dialogue practice. Um, and one of the key, th you know, it's it's not an uh, it, this is like not um, uh, maybe a brilliant observation, but if you have a large community and you're trying to uh, have them get along or understand one another. 
Um, it's really hard to just throw everyone into a space and expect them to just connect at scale. I mean, internet scale, forget about it, right? But even, you know, I'm, I, I work at MIT, 25,000 people. Um, e even in your neighborhood. Even in your neighborhood, right? And so, you know, and, and when you say, all right, well, let's just create an open, inclusive space. It's a town hall meeting. Uh, anyone can come and, and join. Well, if a lot of people join, now you're going to have to limit how long anyone can speak. You have an open mic and it's starting to feel kind of like social media. Who feels comfortable getting in front of an audience and speaking for three minutes? It's kind of a performance dynamic. So breaking large groups into small ones where you feel more comfortable, uh, creating some structure on how you actually um, engage with one another uh, and facilitate that conversation. That was kind of one uh, very old idea that turns out works really well, right? Break into small groups. But then if your goal is to actually create that larger set of connections, that's where we realized we could repurpose much of the technology, including now the kind of incredible new capabilities of AI uh, to create networks where with the consent of people involved, you can say, all right, we just, I just had this conversation with you and a few others and something you just said, I think others ought to hear. Have you I ever been that. in a conversation where you have that feeling like you just yep. shared something that's so powerful? I wish others could just hear that. Not from me secondhand, just from you in your yeah, work. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I mean, I felt that actually. It, so let me let me drive it a specific piece just because of our time. And, and yeah. I felt that when you were talking actually about the LinkedIn stuff, which is it's it's two different norm settings. And you're like, I want to I want to get this out there. So is the technology specifically uh, for the audience? Uh, are you trying to build sort of the new version of a town hall or is it more that you're getting conversation happening in these different digital spheres and these different networks and these different circles? And then the idea is that you're utilizing AI to figure out what in each of these circles is the most relevant thing that other people should hear and then pushing that out. It, it, could you just explain that, that piece a little bit? Yeah. So um, in the couple of minutes we have left, let me just, uh, Set aside AI for a second, just to talk about technology and then go for it. It'll be obvious where the, or, or hopefully clear where the AI comes in. Um, if you um, have a context where small groups can have high quality conversations and there's a desire to be able to share across those small groups, um, then there is a very clear role for the technology. It can bring um, excerpts from one conversation into another. So you literally can cross pollinate and just hear what someone said in another conversation. And so managing consent is important. If you are having many small group conversations, dozens, hundreds, thousands, and you are interested in the patterns that emerge across, there's a very natural role for AI. AI can, um, again, with consent, um, analyze, find themes, find connections that otherwise two different groups or hundreds of groups would have no idea they're actually saying things that rhyme, that there's actually uh, connected mm. connections. Um, let me just come to the idea of civic muscle. Um, we're not trying to build a button that says automate uh, and, and let the AI tell us what we're all have in common. We actually find that, and this comes from the world of qualitative research, that interpreting and contextualizing what that pattern means in our community is a deeply human uh, uh, kind of activity. And so always we're looking for augmentation of the human capability. So there's incredible power in AI being able to listen, deeply understand the semantics, lift up patterns that it sees so that a human sense maker can say, okay, that pattern, this is what this means for us. And in doing that, that person develops a very important role. They're making sense of voices of their peers and creating a kind of bridge. That's fascinating. So I, I, I just, uh, I keep looking out into the distance because um, what you do actually finally clicked for me. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm like a technological Luddite. Like I, I'm like a, a, a dumb like poli sci nerd who reads history books, but there is something fascinating about this. So what you're doing essentially is actually solving a problem that I have all the time, which is my thesis on Bridge USA and the hypothesis is that 
people's pains, people's emotions, people's struggles, challenges, successes, what motivates them are actually all pretty similar. Um, and right now, the only way I can try and convey those things is either to set up these chapters across the country, get people to talk to each other, utilize social media, try to win on social media, get our message out there, try to show that you know there's more that brings us together than divides us. But essentially what you're doing is you're saying, look, what we're doing is we can utilize AI to help people understand the different themes that are in their lives, in their in their localities, in their communities, and then essentially catalyze those out there to help people understand the similarities within themselves without someone having to do the hard work of conveying that. And also the one both discovering those connections and interpreting what they mean, and also uh, where there are differences. Right. Right. The, Absolutely, which is equally important. The, the, it, the kind it, of tapestry. Yeah. Do you do you envision this being a like an online social media s type of platform? Do you envision this being just a a technology that different groups can deploy? And maybe the answer to that is you're not sure yet. But how do you see the application of it? Well, we've we've worked with over 200 organizations around the country. Um, we started with everything being in person conversations, and then analytics and kind of uh, sense making happening uh, through the technology. And, um, and today it's, uh, it's a totally kind of uh, agnostic to whether it happens virtually or in person. There is an app, it's a social network uh, of a very different kind. It's a social dialogue network rather than a social media network. Um, so it's, um, uh, but you know, again, Ground zero for us is small groups of people live in conversation, whether they are live uh, over a, a video link like we are today or in person, uh, our technology works across both. So you can have a conversation in person and the host of the conversation um, take, has consent to record and right. then the voices go into the network. Um, so you, you record it, you put it in, and then it sort of analyzes and, and you get something out. Yeah, and we're uh, we're getting ready to create something that makes sense for college campuses. We are um, we've deployed at MIT at our own campus, and uh, um, in the in the new year, we're going to be able to bring this to other campuses. So we should talk more. Thanks for coming on the show, and I uh, appreciate your time and perspective. You bet. Thanks for having me. Great, great to do this. Thank you so much to Deb for a fascinating conversation that I think hit a lot of relevant topics. You know, where does social media lead us? Why is Twitter built the way it is? How do we leverage our algorithms? What does the future look like as it relates to artificial intelligence? If you like that conversation, like and subscribe on YouTube, leave a review on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your content. Every Monday, we're building this together with each other. We need that support because I think we can actually start to leverage our technologies to incentivize positive, open-minded conversations. And if you believe that, then I'll see you next week on Monday.